Please put your hands together right now for Jonathan Plout. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Hi, my name is John Plout. When I was a kid, I thought I was the world's greatest violin player. And I was playing in the orchestras and I was fiddling away. And as the years went on, I realized that I was sort of slipping further and further back into the first violins. I don't know if the other kids were just practicing more than I was or if I just didn't have the talent or what it was, but before I knew it, I was slipped off the back of the first violinist. So they put me in the second violinist. And there I am at the top of the second violins and I was thinking I was all great. And of course, slowly, slowly, I moved back into the back of the second violins. And then I did the only thing you can do when you slip off the back of the second violin section is I became a viola player. <laughs> and uh, every orchestra needs viola players, but there's fewer of them. So you sort of, you can do it if you're not great. So if you ever meet a viola player, say, oh, you didn't make it as a violin. Ha, ha, ha. Now, I was in college by then, and um, as years went on in college, of course, I slipped further and further back in the viola section, and, and uh, I did the only thing you can do when you fall off the back of the viola section is I went to law school. <laughs> um, and then I became a criminal prosecutor right here in Norfolk County, and uh, I prosecuted all sorts of drug crimes, drug trafficking crimes, uh, heroin, LSD, meth, anything. Uh, but I decided that, you know, I still wanted to be part of that group. I still wanted to be part of a musical experience, and I always loved hard rock. And so I decided I was going to become the next uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen, Ingwe Malmsteen, Alex Lifes, and that sort of thing. So I bought myself a six-string electric guitar. And then I realized it's hard to play the six-string electric guitar. And I did the next best thing. I was thinking, well, what's the viola of the, of the hard rock scene? And it turns out that's the bass guitar. So I bought myself a bass guitar, and I tried to get into a band this way too. And um, then I did, I couldn't really do that. And, uh, and then I did the only thing that you can do when you can't make it in face-to-face -face interactions. I went on Craigslist. I put an ad on Craigslist, bass player looking for a band. I'm not the best bass player you ever heard, but I'm easy to get along with. And I show up on time, and I'm issue free. <laughs> so I get a call from this band up in Woburn. They said, come on up for an audition. So I trundled on up to Woburn. And they said, all right, play me something. So we played him something. He said, you know, you're really not the best bass player we ever heard. <laughs> I said, I am aware of that. And they said, well, you know, we've just lost our bass player, and we're going out on tour, and we need someone to fill in as bass player. I said, great. Within a week, we left on a tour. It was great. I wrote the little chords out on little pieces of paper, and I taped them to the top of my bass guitar, and I'm sitting there playing like this. We were opening up for a group from California made up of uh, some of the former members of Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne and Ronnie James Dio's band and Quiet Riot, and it was just a rock and roll fantasy. Now, while we were out on tour, our lead singer's dog was hit by a car and slaughtered. The woman felt terrible. She picked up the dog, looked at the dog tag, went to the man's house, knocked on the door, wanted to tell him. He didn't answer. Of course, he was out on tour with us. She didn't know what to do. She went to go get the police. The police came. They knocked on the door, still didn't answer. They knocked down the door. They went inside to do a well-being search. They didn't find him, of course, but they found huge marijuana plants, <laughs> sun lamps, baggies, scales, little ledgers of who owed him what. They let, we didn't know any of this. They left, the, the cops left, got a search warrant, came back, executed the search warrant, ransacked the house, gathered all the evidence, closed up the house. We get back from the tour. The lead singer was about to say to me, John, thank you for filling in his bass player, and now we're going to go get a real bass player. But his house had been ransacked, his dog was dead, and there was an arrest warrant out for him for drug manufacturing. And I said, wait, this gives me an idea. I figured out the way that I can finally stay in a musical group. I could represent this guy in his drug manufacturing charge. And then I thought, does that mean I'd be sort of used as a lawyer, and that means he didn't want me as a bass player? And then I thought, yeah, sort of. And then I thought, but so what? I wanted to be the bass player in a hard rock band. He wanted to stay out of jail. I'm not too proud to do that. And you just can't, you just, desperate times 
call for desperate measures. So I said, Tom, you gave me my rock and roll fantasy. I'm going to defend you in this drug manufacturing case. <laughs> for the next nine months, I'm filing motions to suppress, motions to dismiss. I'm working with the probation department. I'm jumping up and down in front of the judge. Meanwhile, he's not going to kick his lawyer bass player out of his band. We're rehearsing. We're practicing. I'm learning how to be a hard rock bass player. And nine months later, when I got him five years probation and kept him out of jail, I was good enough to be the bass player in his band. <laughs> so, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. And, uh, and um, that was 10 years ago. And with a couple of personnel changes, we're still playing together. In fact, next month, we're playing at the Battle of the Bands at the Hard Rock Cafe, if, uh, if you're around. So, you gotta do what you gotta do. Make those waves. <laughs>